Hello, I'm reading from Autobiography of a Yogi. I'm starting at the top of page 62, uh, chapter 6, The Tiger Swami. I was quite willing to believe that the titan before me was able to perform the tiger pussycat metamorphosis. He seemed to be in a didactic mood. Chandy and I listened respectfully. Mind is the welder of the muscles. The force of a hammer blow depends on the energy applied. The power expressed by a man's bodily instrument depends on his aggressive will and courage. The body is literally manufactured and sustained by the mind. Though pressure of instincts from past lives, through pressure of instincts from last past lives, strengths or weaknesses percolate gradually into human consciousness. They express as habits, which in turn manifest as a desirable or an undesirable body. Outward frailty has a mental origin. In a vicious circle, the habit-bound body thwarts the mind. If the master allows himself to be commanded by a servant, the latter becomes autocratic. The mind is similarly enslaved by submitting to bodily dictation. At our entreaty, the impressive Swami consented to tell us something of his own life. My earliest ambition was to fight tigers. My will was mighty, but my body was feeble. An ejaculation of surprise broke from me. Uh, it appeared incredible that this man now with the Atlantean shoulders fit to bear could ever have known weakness. It was by indomitable persistency in thoughts of health and strength that I overcame my handicap. I have every reason to extol the compelling mental vigor which I found to be the real subduer of royal Bengals. Do you think, revered Swami, that I could fight tigers? This was the first and the last time that the bizarre amb ambition ever visited my mind. Yes, he said, smiling, but there are many kinds of tigers. Some roam in the jungles of human desires. No spiritual benefit accrues by knocking beast unconscious. Rather be victor over the inner prowlers. May we hear, sir, how you change from a tamer of wild tigers to a tamer of wild passions? The tiger swami fell in silence. Remoteness came into his gaze. Summoning visions of bygone years, I discerned his slight mental struggle to decide whether to grant my request. Finally, he smiled in acquiescence. When my fame reached a zenith, it brought the intoxication of pride. I decided not only to fight tigers, but to display them in various tricks. My ambition was to force savage beasts to behave like domesticated ones. I began to perform my feats publicly with gratifying success. One evening, my father entered my room in, a pens in pensive mood. Son, I have words of warning. I would save you from coming ills produced by the grinding wheels of cause and effect. Are you a fatalist, father? Should superstition be allowed to discolor the powerful waters of my activities? I am not a fatalist, son, but I believe in the just law of retribution as taught in the Holy Scriptures. There is resentment against you in the jungle family. Sometime it may, cost, it may act to your cost. Father, you astonish me. You well know what tigers are, beautiful but merciless. Who knows? My blows may inject some slight sanity of consideration into their thick heads. I am headmaster in a forest finishing school to teach them gentle manners. Please, Father, think of me as a tiger tamer and never as a tiger killer. How could my good actions bring ill upon me? I beg you not to impose any command that I change in my way of life. Chandy and I were all attention understanding the past dilemma. In India, a child does not lightly disobey his parents' wishes. The tiger swami went on. In stoic silence, father listened to my explanation. He followed it with a disclosure which was uttered gravely. Son, you compel me to relate an ominous prediction from the lips of a saint. 
He approached me yesterday as I sat on the veranda in my daily meditation. Dear friend, I come to you with a message for your belligerent son. Let him cease his savage activities. Otherwise, his next tiger encounter shall result in severe wounds, followed by six months of deadly sickness. He shall then forsake his former ways and become a monk. This tale did not impress me. I considered that Father had been the credulous victim of a deluded fanatic. The tiger swami made this confession with an impatient gesture, as though at some stupidity. Grimly silent for a long time, he deemed oblivious of our presence. When he took up the dangling thread of his narrative, it was suddenly with subdued voice. Not long after Father's warning, I visited the capital city of Kuch Bihar. The Pishkaresh territory was new to me, and I expected a restful change. As usual, everywhere a curious crowd followed me on the streets. I would catch bits of whispered comment. This is the man who fights wild tigers. Has he legs or tree trunks? Look at his face. He must be an incarnation of the king of tigers himself. You know how village urchins function like final editions of a newspaper. With what speed do the even later speech bulletins of the woman circulate from house to house? Within a few hours, the whole city was in a state of excitement over my presence. I was relaxing quietly in the evening when I heard the hoofbeats of galloping horses. They stopped in front of my dwelling place. In came a number of tall, turbaned policemen. I was taken aback. All things are possible unto these creatures of human law, I thought. I wonder if they are going to take me to task about matters utterly unknown to me. But the officers bowed with unwanted courtesy. Honored sir, we are sent to welcome you on behalf of the Prince of Kuch Bahar. He is pleased to invite you to his palace tomorrow morning. I speculated a while on the prospect. For some obscure reason I felt sharp regret at this interpretation, interruption in my quiet trip. But the suppliant, suppliant, suppliant manner of the policeman moved me. I agreed to go. I was bewildered the next day to be obsequiously escorted from my door into a magnificent coach drawn by four horses. A servant held an ornate umbrella to protect me from the scorching sunlight. I enjoyed the pleasant ride through the city in its wood, woodland outskirts. The royal Scoin himself was at the palace door to welcome me. He preferred his own gold brocaded seat, smilingly placing himself in a chair of simpler design. In all politeness, all this politeness is certainly going to cost me something, I thought in mounting astonishment. The prince's motive emerged after a few casual remarks. My city is filled with a rumor that you can fight wild tigers with nothing more than your naked hands. Is that a fact? It is quite true. I can scarcely believe it. You are a Calcutta Bengali nurtured on the white rice of city folk. Be frank, please. <coughs> Have you not been fighting only spineless, opium-fed animals? <coughs> His voice was loud and sarcastic. His speech tingled with provincial accent. I vouchsafe no reply to his insulting question. I challenge you to fight my newly caught tiger, Raja Begum. If you have been success, if you can successfully resist him, bind him with a chain and depart his cage in a conscious state, I shall have this. You shall have this royal Bengal. Several thousand rupees and many other gifts shall also be bestowed. Bestowed. If you refuse to meet him in combat, I shall blazon your name throughout the state as an impostor. And there was a poster, an, an, an asterisk next to Raja Bagam. Uh, it says, Prince, Princess, so named to indicate that this beast possessed the combined ferocity of tiger and tigress. Back, starting back again. His insolent words struck me with a, like a volley of bullets. I shot an angry acceptance. Half risen from the chair in my excitement, the, half risen from the chair in his excitement, the prince sank back with a sadistic smile. 
I was reminded of the Roman emperors who had delighted sending Christians in bestial arenas. arenas. He said, The match will be set for a week hence. I regret that I cannot give you permission to view the tiger in advance. Whether the prince feared I might seek to hypnotize the beast or secretly feed him opium, I do not know. I left the palace, noting with amusement that the royal umbrella and panoplied co coach were now missing. The following week, I methodically prepared my mind and body for the coming ordeal. Through my servant, I learned of fantastic tales. The saint's direful prediction of, to my father had somehow got abroad, enlarging as it ran. Many simple villagers believed that an evil spirit cursed by the gods had reincarnated as a tiger which took various demonic forms at night but remained a striped animal during the day. This demon tiger was supposed to be the one to humble me. An imaginative version was that animal prayers to tiger heaven had achieved a response in the shape of Raja Bagam. He was to be the instrument to punish me, the audacious biped so insulting to the entire tiger species, a furless, fangless man daring to challenge a claw-armored, sturdy-limbed tiger, the force of concentrated venom in all humiliated tigers, the villagers declared, had gathered momentum sufficient to operate hidden laws and bring about the fall of the proud tiger tamer. My servant further apprised me that the prince was in his element as manager of the bout between man and beast. He had supervised the erection of a storm-proof pavilion designed to accommodate thousands. Its center held Raja Bagam in an enormous iron cage surrounded by an outer safety room. The captive emitted a ceaseless series of blood-curdling roars. He was fed sparingly to kindle a wrathful appetite. Perhaps the prince expected me to be the meal of reward. Crowds from the city and suburbs bought tickets eagerly in response to the beat of drums announcing the unique contest. The day of battle saw hundreds turned away for lack of seats. Many men broke through the tent openings or crowded any space below the galleries. As the Tiger Swami's story approached a climax, my excitement mounted with it. Chande also was rapidly mute. Amidst piercing sound explosions from Raja Begum, the and the hubbub of the terrified crowd, I quietly made my appearance. Scantily clad, clad around the waist, I was otherwise unprotected by clothing. I opened the bolt on the door of the safety room and calmly locked it behind me. The tiger sensed blood, leaping with a thunderous crash on the bars, he sent forth a ferocious welcome. The audience was hushed with pitiful fear. I seemed a meek lamb before the raging beast. In a thrice I was within the cage, but as I slammed the door, Raja Bagum was headlong upon me. My right hand was desperately torn. Human blood, the greatest tree to tire can know, fell in appalling streams. The prophecy of the saint seemed almost to, about to be fulfilled. I rallied instantly from the shock of the first, of the first serious injury I had ever received banishing the sight of my gory fingers by thrusting them beneath my waist cloth. I swung my left arm in a bone-cracking blow. The beast reeled back, swirled around the rear of the cage, and sprang forward convulsively. My famous fistic punishment rained on his head. As Raja Begum's taste of blood had acted like the maddening first sip of wine to a dipsomanic long-deprived, Punctuated by deafening roars, the brute's assaults grew in fury. My inadequate defense of only one hand left me vulnerable before claws and fangs, but I dealt out dazing retribution. Mutually ensanguined, we struggled as to the death. The cage was pandemonium as blood splashed in all directions and blasts of pain and lethal lust came from the bestial throat. Shoot him, kill the tiger, shrieks rose from the audience so fast did man and beast move that a guard's bullet went amiss. I mustered all my will force, bellowed fiercely, and landed a final concussive blow. The tiger collapsed and lay quietly. Like a pussycat, I interjected. 
The Swami laughed with hearty appreciation, then continued the engrossing tale. Raja Bagum was vanquished at last. His royal pride was further humbled with my lacerated hands I audaciously forced open his jaws. For a dramatic moment I held my head within the yawning death trap. I looked around for a chain. Pulling, me, pulling from a pile on the floor, I bound the tiger by his neck to the cage bars. In triumph I moved towards the door. But that fiend incarnate, Rajag Bagam, had a stamina worthy of his supposed demonic origin. With an incredible lunge, he snapped the chain and leaped on my back. My shoulder fast in his jaws, I fell violently, but in a thrice I had him pinned beneath me. Under merciless blows, the treacherous animal sank into semi-consciousness. This time I secured him more carefully. Slowly I left the cage. I found myself in a new uproar, this time one of delight. The crowd's cheer broke as though from a single gigantic throat. Disaster, disastrously mauled, I had yet fulfilled the three conditions of the fight, stunning the tiger, binding him with a chain, and leaving him without requiring the assistance for myself. In addition, I had so drastically injured and frightened the aggressive beast that he had been content to overlook the opportune prize of my head and his mouth. After my wounds had been treated, I was honored in Garland. Many gold pieces were showered at my feet. The whole city entered a holiday period. Endless discussions were heard on all sides about my victory over one of the largest and most savage tigers ever seen. Raja Begum was presented to me as promised, but I felt no elation. A spiritual change had entered my heart. It seemed that my final exit from the cage would also close the door on my worldly ambitions. A woeful period followed. For six months I lay near death with blood poisoning. As soon as I was well enough to leave Kuch Bahar, I returned to my native town. I know now that my teacher is the holy man who gave the wise warning. Humbly made this confession to my father. Oh, that I could only find him. My longing was sincere, for one day the saint arrived unheralded. Enough of tiger taming, he spoke with calm assurance. Come with me. I will teach you to subdue the beast of ignorance roaming in the jungles of the human mind. You are used, used to an audience... Let it be a galaxy of angels entertained by your thrilling mastery of yoga. I was initiated into the spiritual path by my saintly guru. He opened my spiritual doors, rusty and resistant, with long disuse. Hand in hand, we, stood set, we soon set out for my training in the Himalayas. Chandi and I bowed at the Swami's feet, grateful for his outline of a cyclonic life. My friend and I felt amply repaid for the long probationary wait in the cold parlor. Chapter 7 The Levitating Saint I saw a yogi remain in the air several feet above the ground last night at a group meeting. My friend Upendra Mohan Chowl de Hurry spoke impressively. I gave him an enthusiastic smile. Perhaps I can guess his name. Was it Bahanduri Masaya of Upper Calcutta Road? Er, Pindra nodded. A little crestfallen, not to be a, a news bearer. My inquisitiveness about saints was well known to my friends. They delighted in setting me on a fresh track. The yogi lives so close to my home that I often visit him. My words brought keen interest to Upendra's face, and I made a further confidence. I have seen him in remarkable feats. He has expertly mastered the various pranayamas mentioned in the ancient Eightfold Yoga outline of Pintanjali. Okay, there's an asterisk and a cross. The asterisk reads, Methods of Controlling Life Force Prana through the regulation of breath, the bahastrishka bellows, prandahayama, makes the mind steady. And the cross next to Pantanjali, foremost exponent of yoga. Uh, starting again. Once 
blew her moss, uh, performed the Bastriska Pranayama before me with such amazing force that it seemed an actual storm had arisen in the room. Then he extinguished the thundering breath and remained motionless in a high state of superconsciousness. The aura of peace after the storm was vivid beyond forgetting. And there's a double cross there. It says, Professor Jules Boys of the Sorbonne said in 1928 that French psychologists have investigated and accorded recognition into the superconsciousness, which in its grandeur is the exact opposite of the subconscious mind as conceived by Freud, and which comprises the facilities for the faculties that make man really man and not just a super animal. The French savant explained that the awakening of the higher consciousness is not just not to be confused with coisquism or hypnotism. The existence of a superconscious mind has long been recognized philosophically, being in reality the oversoul spoken of by Emerson but only recently has been recognized scientifically. In the Oversoul, Emerson wrote, A man is the facade of a, simple, of a temple wherein all wisdom and good abide. When he commonly called man the eating, drinking, planting, counting man does not, as we know him, represent himself but misrepresents himself. Him we do not respect but the soul whose organ he is would be let would he let it appear through his actions would make our knees bend we lie open on one side to to the depths to the deeps of spiritual nature to all the attributes of god okay starting again i have heard that the saint never leaves his home upenda's tone was a trifle incredulous indeed it is true he has lived indoors for the past 20 years, he slightly relaxes his self-imposed rules at the time of our holy festivals when he goes as far as his front sidewalk. The beggars gather there because Saint Bahaduri is known for his tender heart. How does he remain in the air defying the law of gravitation? A yogi's body loses its grossness after use of certain pranayamas. Then it is able, then it will levitate or hop about like a leaping frog. Even saints who do not practice a formal yoga have been known to levitate during a state of intense devotion to God. It, I would like to know more about this sage. Do you attend his evening meetings? Upenda's eyes were sparkling with curiosity. Yes, I go often. I am vastly entertained by the wit and his wisdom. Occasionally, my profound, prolonged laughter mars the solemnity of his gatherings. The saint is not displeased, but his disciples look daggers. On my way home from school that afternoon, I passed Ben Hurduri Masaya's cloister and decided on a visit. The yogi was inaccessible to the general public. A lone dis disciple occupying the ground floor guarded his master's privacy. The student was something of a marinet, martinet, martinet. He would, he now inquired formally if I had an engagement. His guru put in an appearance just in time to save me from summary ejection. Let Mukum, Mukunda come when he will. The sage's eyes twinkled. The rule of seclusion is not for my own comfort, it is but for that of others. Worldly people do not like the candor that shatters their delusions. Saints are not only rare but disconcerting. Even in scripture they are often found embarrassing. I followed Bahanduri Masaya to his austere quarters on the top floor, from which he seldom stirred. Masters often ignore the, the panorama of the world to do out of focus till centered in the ages. 
The contemporaries of a sage are not only those the contemporaries of a sage are not only those of the narrow present. Masara Maharasisi Rishi, you are the first yogi I have never known who always stays indoors. God plants his saints sometimes in, un in an unexpected soil, lest we think he may reduce them to a rule. God plants his saints sometimes in unexpected soil, lest we think we may reduce him to a rule. The, so the sage locked his vibrant body in the lotus posture. In his seventies he displayed no unpleasing signs of age or sedentary life. Stalwart and straight, he was ideal in every respect. His face was that of a rishi, as described in the ancient texts. Noble-headed, abundantly bearded, he always sat firmly upright, his quiet, quiet eyes fixed on omnipresence. The saint and I entered the meditative state. After an hour, his gentle voice roused me. You go often into the silence, but have you developed uh, Nub Havna? He was reminding me to love God more than meditation. Do not mistake the technique for the goal. He often he offered me some mangoes. With a good humored wit that I found so delightful in his grave nature, I re he remarked, People are general people in general are more fond of jala yoga union with food than with the han yoga union with god his yogic pun affected me uproariously what a laugh you have an affectionate gleam came into his gaze his own face was always serious yet subtly touched by the ecstatic smile his large lotus eyes held a hidden divine laughter Okay, there's an apostrophe next to Mahara Rishi, uh, which is translated Great Sage. And then there's a cross next to Abnubhava, and it says Actual Perception of God. This is a picture of the uh, levitating saint. Those letters come from far off America, the sage indicated several thick envelopes on a table. I correspond with a few societies there whose members are interested in yoga. They are discovering India anew with a better sense of direction than Columbus. I am glad to help them. A knowledge of yoga, like the daylight, is free to all who receive it. What Rishis perceived as essential for human salvation need not be diluted for the West. Alike in soul through diverse outer experience, neither west nor east will flourish if some form of disciplinary yoga be not practiced. The saint, the saint held me with his tranquil eyes. I did not realize that his speech was a veiled prophetic guidance. It is only now, as I write these words, that I understand the full meaning of the casual intimations he often gave me that someday I would carry India's te teachings to America. Maharashi, I wish you would write a book on yoga for the benefit of the world. I am training disciples. They and their line of students will serve as living volumes, proof against the natural disintegrations of time and the unnatural interpretation of critics. I, remain alone, I remained alone with the yogi until his disciples arrived in the evening. Bahaduri Masaya began one of his intimidable discourses. Like a peaceful flood, he swept away the mental debris of his listeners, floating them Godward. His striking parables were expressed in flawless Bengali. That this evening, Bahanduri expounded various philosophical points connected with the life of Marab Babi, a medieval Rapjapani princess who had abandoned her court life to seek the company of saints. One great sannyasi, the Santa Goswami, refused to receive her because she was a woman 
Her reply brought him humbly to her feet. Tell the master, she said, that I did not know there was any male in the universe save God. Are we all not females before him? A scriptural conception of the Lord as the only positive creative principle, his creation being brought being naught but a passive maya. Narabe composed many ecstatic songs which are still treasured in India. I translate one of them here. Okay, we'll take up at that point uh, in the next reading. Talk to you later. Bye.